7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Transparency Talks Podcast. I am your girl, the hostess with the most is Butter B. Rocker. Listen, we have an amazing show for you today. But before I bring on my special guest, I just want to thank you guys so much for supporting my film, Finding the Perfect Guy, that I executive wrote, produced, directed, and you know your girl started it and put on music in it. It is now streaming on 23, da -da 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 -da, 23 streaming platforms. So you know I am super excited about that. It's been out officially for seven months. So you know, for me, that's a big deal. So thank you, thank you, thank you for everybody that has supported me. It is now also in India. It is in Africa and it is in um, United Arab. So thank you. I'm, I'm excited. Last but not least for my announcements, BBR Indie Films is back. We are now taking submissions for your short films. 20 minutes are under. Um, you can go to bbrmediagroup.com to submit or BBR um, I'm sorry, Film Freeway dot com forward slash bbr indie films i will put the information in the link the actual event is on may 15th which is my birthday at studio movie grill in marietta georgia so get your short films to us today cannot wait to premiere you and we have an amazing lineup of panelists but y'all did not come here for me y'all came here for this man he is an uh, emmy award-winning writer and filmmaker can you please show some love for chris silver Hello, King. How are you? I was thinking, should I like come 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 up like slowly? Like, <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Chris? You know, I'm doing really great, and um, I'm amazed by w w what you're doing here. Thank you for having me. I think it's cool that you're bringing people together, and you know, with consistency and with passion. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Since I transitioned from music into film, I'm trying to make sure that with my podcast, I'm giving people a little bit of both um, with the interviews and stuff that I have. And um, I just found out a secret about you. You technically are in both worlds like me. That is true. I'm a music person. I've actually, I actually, there's a, there's a poster here. I actually did a musical a couple of years ago that um, based on a, on a very successful European film, Knocking on Heaven's Door. And um, so I still write lyrics every once in a while. And I, I have a composer in Hollywood that I do some writing with every once in a while so where we're getting ready to do something else. And sometimes I still sing, but very rarely. Okay, okay. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to hear some of your, your tracks and everything. I'm very intrigued to hear your vocals. Hear yeah, vocals. When I sing nowadays, I used to sing like rock music. Nowadays, I'm more like a, more like a crooner, you know? Mm. I go okay. like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> songs and stuff. I, I like that stuff. <laughs> okay, like that. well, can yeah. you tell everybody a little bit of background about yourself? Yes. Oh my God, where do I start? So I was born in Berlin. You might hear a slight accent, <laughs> but I was born in Berlin. I was raised mostly in Germany I, uh, by a by an English father and a German mother, and um, grew up in theater mostly. As a kid, I was a stage actor musician performer that, but but always found myself loving writing had a lot of writing people in my family the journalists writers my my even my great grandfather i just found out ran an amateur theater and like it was in the family line writing and, and doing things like that and so uh, eventually i found myself more and more at home there and i ended up start writing with friends that were in film school and i would write scripts for them and, and that's how i slowly and through some playwriting too for stage i got into film writing and then over there, in, in, mostly in Germany, um, 
I became pretty big actually in, in, in the German script world. I still do a lot of writing and a lot of projects there, creating my own series as well, doing a lot of projects. And my, my biggest passion is really for a lot of truth-based stories, um, bringing new voices into the, into the media. Like I love having new writers, people whose perspectives haven't been heard and haven't been seen, probably also because my kids are black and, and my whole family has like a civil rights background. So that might also be part of my passion there. But, but just, it's just been fun to use my voice and my artistic abilities for, you know, to, to sort of broaden the stage of what's heard in the world. And last but not least, it's already getting a long introduction. Uh, I have lived in the US for 15 years. I'm married to a wonderful American actress and I have an American life too. And I have American kids and I, and I do some American work as well. I've done for quite a few, quite a bit now, but I've always lived sort of by, what do you call that? By coastal, by something. Yes. I, I, I do work in Europe as well as here, but more in Europe than here. Okay. Well, you have, that, that was an amazing story. You have some great things going on for yourself. I actually, had a chance to interview your lovely wife, who is also an actress, on my podcast and had her at my last event. So we're definitely going to be talking about her. Yes. Um, I want to dive a little bit more into your career. You've had a successful career in both film and television. What initially drew you to filmmaking and what made you decide to move from movies into films? I mean, into television. My love for film actually started from as for most people as a kid and with me it was a specific thing because I spent a lot of time alone I had very busy parents and mostly was raised by my mother alone and my stepdad was kind of in and out and so my babysitter was a movie theater I would go it was very cheap I grew up in East Berlin in a really different age of life and of, of, of history and uh, I was able to like for 50 East German cents a week or something like that you could be a, a club member at the cinema club or like a month even and so i would go after school and i would just walk into the theater because it was a walking distance and i would watch anything that was on and they had like they were one of those theaters that had like an art house theater so they had a lot of old movies and stuff so i kind of it was like going to film school and i just found myself sitting there and thinking like making stories with light you know this thing of like sitting in a dark room with other people and the light comes on it the magic of that has never stopped like my wife Tracy and I like we go to, to the movies pretty much almost every week. Like like we just need that magic in our lives and and that I just at some point knew. Wait a minute, I can be part of that because through my family, theater people and stuff, I knew some people. I got to meet some people that were doing that. I was like, I want to get there. I want to figure out how to be there. At first, I wanted to be an actor, of course, and then did some of that too. And then step by step, I found that writing was my way. And then television. Uh, happened just kind of naturally because it was a way in. Like before mm -hmm. I got my first film out, the first job that I could get that was connected with all of this was, wasn't television. I had written a play. The director of the play knew a, a film producer, brought him to the premiere and and he said, hey, young, young one, I hear that you're interested. Um, let's talk. And he liked me and got me on a series where I was a research assistant and worked my way up. Yeah. Wow. That's a great story. I'm also a play writer. I, um, I want to turn my play into a film. So that's mm -hmm. really cool to hear that that's what you did. Or that's what you, that's how yeah. you got in. I mean, right? theater, is, theater is my other big love because as a kid I played, I acted in theater and I had through my family, there were several people involved in theater. And now I'm married to a wonderful actress, Tracy Graves, who also plays on stage and in film. And like, I, I find, if you can do both, it's great. I think I think for actors, even as well as writers, directors, both sort of inform each other and keep giving you new perspectives on storytelling that are very valuable because they're so different and yet they're both dramatic storytelling. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so you've worn many hats throughout your career from screenwriting, mm -hmm. producing. Can you walk us through the process of bringing a story from concept to screen and highlight the different roles you've played? That's a powerful question. <laughs> I oh, mean, it, it almost it kind of differs in many different in in, in various projects uh, from project to project, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, like what often, for instance, for me, uh, I have a lot of stories that just come to me because I've always wanted to tell them, and I'm still not done telling them. I have a lot of stories in my family and and, and through my own experience. 
so there's always that little pile of stories. And every once in a while, that's just what happened, that one of them is ready. And then I start breaking it down, outlining it and pitching it, and hopefully being able to make a movie of it, or that becomes the seed of something. The other avenue is that someone comes to me and offers me a project, because in Germany, I'm at a place in my career where that's possible for me, that people just come and say, hey, um, I've got something. Would you be interested? We would love you on it. Um, but what what's always like like from a personal perspective of like my, my craft mm -hmm. mostly as a writer and now also more and more there are invitations to 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 doing it as as a director as well and producing more stuff but from my craft perspective it always starts with with the big question why me like like i never i try not to get lost in the idea of oh because i'm good and i'm successful and i've won some awards that means I have to be right for every project, but I'm always taking that moment to think, why is this the right time and I'm the right person? Hmm. You know, why me, why now? I always ask that because I, if I can't answer that from from, from a place inside and, 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 you know, connected to what I believe in and what's important to me, then I probably shouldn't be doing it. And if I still do it for other reasons, then usually it doesn't work out so well. Yeah. Um, and then that sort of answering that question then becomes a, a theme for the entire process. Like then everyone you, you work with and you talk to, because you know why you're doing it. And that makes right. it easier to, to go through the process of, you know, I mean, you know, the technical steps, of course. I mean, you, you, you know, you're, I'm always, I'm a big fan of, 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 of Miro boards, you know, like I, I do everything on, on, on the computer now, but like I'm, I'm always boarding and outlining projects. I love cards and boarding projects finding act structures and then changing them a million times. And I love working with partners that are able to rethink a project a lot. That's what's exciting about script writing, mm -hmm. that you're never really finished. Yeah. Uh, and in the editing room, you still realize that something didn't quite work the way you thought. And so that's why it's sort of, it's, it's a tricky question because there's so many different ways that something could happen and that something could come to fruition. And also there's the question of, are you doing it with partners or not? Do you have co-writers? Do you have a writer's room in, in, in case of a series? Yeah, it's a, that's what I love about it, that it's, that it's uh, so versatile. I love it. How has your experience growing up in Berlin and London influenced your storytelling? Um, yeah, I mean, it's really like the 85% of my life have been Berlin kind of. It's uh, And then a, bit, a little bit of London, a little bit of other places. Um, I think mostly what's mostly informed my storytelling is the connection of the places I've lived with a family history because I just happen to have some pretty crazy stories in my family history. So my step grandmother was a spy in World War II. She fought Hitler oh, wow. in World War II. She did some pretty big things. There's some there's some big books about her. My grandfather was an anti, like he was a denazification officer in world, after the World War. So he was, so his own father was killed in a concentration camp for his political beliefs. And then he would come, uh, you know, because he stood up to his beliefs and the Nazis killed him. And, and, and my grandfather, as a son, came back after the war and um, started to sit down and have these interrogations with like leading Nazis, leading Nazi officers and try to see do these people belong in jail or is it possible to teach them new ways? So I'm just giving you like two little spotlights for my, but there's so many uh, big storylines in my own life that I always felt connected with the history of where I lived because there was so much history in my upbringing and so mm -hmm. much also responsibility. It's like, you can't just sit here and twiddle your thumbs. You kind of have to, do something meaningful with your life because yeah. people in my bloodline have done that. And, and so that's, yeah, like living in all these different places, like the theme that it's given me because I've also, I mean, I spent many years living in New York then Los Angeles, now I'm in Atlanta, but the theme that I've gotten through all of this is maybe we can eventually bring people together through just looking at our humanity rather than mm -hmm looking at you know what's different about us it's a, the things that are different about us are important don't get me wrong in many but it's a matter of context in another in a bigger spiritual context um it's important that we also figure out what connects us and what unites us i love it i love it's it 
<laughs> Look, I got, got this right here. <laughs> so I mean it. It's important to me, OK? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, looking back, is there a particular project that you're most proud of and why? Um, uh, having been a part of, of something big like Good by Lenin was very important to me. Good by Lenin was a film that internationally really hit big. And having been a part of that meant that the doors open internationally. Like today, when I go, like my wife was shooting. Um, the Exorcist Believer, and I came with her to the set, and the director immediately knew Goodbye Lenin. It's like it's like a, it's having a calling card. It's one of those films that it's been around for over like twenty years now. That movie, but it opened all the all my doors on it. So that's I'm still very thankful for that. And there's a couple, of, but you know, I really I'm always like like most artists, I'm always mostly in love with the with the latest thing that I'm doing. Yeah, like Saxon was really important to me, which you could still see now, and we we just talked about it before. Um, so right now, that's probably the project I'm most excited still about because it's just been out for a year. We worked on it for so many years. We're mm -hmm. still like about to pick up an award for it and stuff. So those things are, that comes to mind the most probably right now. Okay. Well, we talked about it off stage. So let's talk about it now. Your new project is Sam, Sam and Saxon is on Hulu and Disney. It's a series. It is about the portrayal of black identity in German history, um, yes. which is often not explored. So what made you want to tell this story and how did you find the, the first German black officer? Yeah. So first and foremost, you're absolutely right. This story has um, a story like this has never been told in German film and television, period. Like as as a as a dramatic piece. Yeah no one's ever done this so it is the first real major afro-german that's the term um afro-german series and um that alone is just an amazing thing to be to, to be able to be a part of the 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 root of the project from my end was that i'm very close friends with the guy who knew the original person that the story is about it's a true story the first black policeman in, in east germany and that's my good friend Tyron Ricketts, who was a creator and, a, and an executive producer on the show and also was, was in the writer's room and also acted in it. And Tyron came to me over 10 years ago and said, Chris, um, I'm, I've been working on this and I'm thinking, can like, can we sit down and actually do some do some outlining and some, and some like figuring out how what it could look like as a series because it was initially thought of as a movie. And so we started doing that. and. Then, you know, another guy who had already been involved, who is our other co-creator, Jörg Winger, an amazing producer, writer, and, and great friend, um, was also involved. So so that's how, that, that's the technical process. I got the project through, through Tyron, who fought for this his whole life and, 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 and did an amazing work. And then we just got lucky that we had um, all the other elements coming together, and partly it was a fight. Some of it was lucky, like, like running into a guy like Malik Bauer, who really looks like the original character and is... He's like, he has the body of the rock, but the sensitivity of 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 an absolute, like mega performer. He's, he's just mm -hmm. a really, really strong actor, and a great guy. And um, so that was lucky. But another other things were just also a struggle because, of course, we 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 had to convince people that um, this is a show that we're not going to do in the regular style <laughs> because it's a new show. So. Yes, we want half at least half of the people on the set to be black. We want at least half of the writers' room to be black. We want like all of that was that was hard work to convince people of of, of going that way with it. But Disney was very kind and very open. And yeah, now you can see it on Hulu in the United States, which is owned by Disney, if you don't know. And um and on Disney Worldwide, Disney Plus Worldwide, yeah. I have started looking at the series and honestly, I was blown away. Like I, I didn't even want to go to sleep last night. I forced myself to turn it off at two o'clock this morning because I needed to get up early. But honestly, it it draws you in, and it's a really great storyline. I'm 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 surprised to see all of the things that he had to endure, but I'm not surprised. Right. And to see how you cleverly, you know, are is showing the story and. I mean, we're really getting a true perspective of what happened and, and the, the struggles that this man had to endure. Um, it, it's it's really a great film. And I'm not just saying that. I mean, just saying it to okay. say it, it's a great series. 
And I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just testament to the fact that we didn't just find a story that hasn't been told before, but we, I think we did really do our homework and make made sure that, I mean, including Jörg and I as, as the white co-creators. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I was picked was also that I do have two black kids who have spent quite a lot of time in Germany as well. And that, so from that side, I also possibly have like, and, and I grew up in East Germany, so I, so I have at least a glimpse of Afro-German reality and understanding, but at the same time, I'm not stupid. You know, I know that it's not up to me to tell stories from a perspective that I haven't really lived. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my people went through a lot of nasty things in German history as well, because we were never on the right side of, uh, on the, you know, side of the winners. Um, uh because you know a lot of my people were either jewish or civil rights activists and you know left wingers and stuff and so they they, they went through a lot but but i can't compare that to the black experience and i it for me it was a learning experience and so we just really made sure that we had like we went through a lot of check checking points you know we had consultants and people reading it and people telling us if this and that rang true to us and, and taking that time and listening in that way hiring directors two female directors who both have an immigrant like one has an immigrant backstory and and, and the other one you know um also has 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 a black um line in her family and so so all of those elements were just what what I'm happy that we were able to prove that when you do that you come up with better television you're not yeah. just then, oh great they put some diversity in great now let's give them awards no it actually becomes better storytelling yeah yeah honestly it's it's great storytelling at its finest <laughs> um what is your experience working in international markets versus hollywood um yeah great question uh, there is i had to learn a couple of things when i first came to Hollywood. And of course, you know, look, since I grew up mostly uh, like pretty much bilingual, I always knew that if I'm getting a chance, I'm going to spend time there because I felt like, why the hell not? Why wouldn't I want to do this? And because um, you want to at least try it, just like you want to take a bite out of the Big Apple, as they say, you want to you want to try New York. I've done that. You want to try LA. And so, yeah, it ended up being eight years. But what I first realized most of all is that What's different in Hollywood is that the, obviously the professionalism is is is, is insane mm -hmm. when it comes to how film is made. Uh, more than anywhere else I've seen it, and the, trust me, the German film business is impressive, and they're great professionals. But just the, the 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 attention to everything in terms of everything in the process is just there's no place like 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 um, like LA in that regard in, in the way films are made there. Now they're not really made there, but the, the deals are made there and a lot of the storytelling still comes from their roots in it. But the biggest thing, really the biggest difference is actually um, the marketing aspect of Hollywood, like that everyone gets their tiny little window in which they have to impress and sell themselves because it's a huge marketplace. And that I was not used to because neither in a German mentality nor in, a, in an English mentality is it is it natural to be loud and big about yourself and tell everyone how cool you are and slip in as many things as you can so people remember you know you don't grab attention like that for yourself in in europe it's or in england it's kind of rather seen as rude or silly and i had to learn that in in, in hollywood um either you do that or within a minute you lose interest you lose people's interest if you come in there and you go like yeah you know i've done a couple of things and you know a couple of projects like you can't do that like people are immediately moving on to the next person right. so you kind of Hollywood, you're going to have to come into the room and be like i'm the right person for you because of i'm going to tell you three reasons <laughs> yeah right. and he, here's who i am and here's what i got and woo and and and, and you got to excite people and, and fascinate them and wow them and that also leads to a lot of lying which i don't li like so much and, and there's a lot of fakeness in, in 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 the in the industry here in, in the us that i don't appreciate mm -hmm. Um, there's also a selfishness uh, that I sometimes notice uh, that, I mean, but that's film in general. Maybe it's a little less in some other international markets. But having worked all over the world, I just feel this is a business that constantly needs new people. We constantly need, need new talent. We need new, it makes us all better. Mm -hmm. And 
sometimes because of this having to sell yourself so hard, this American mindset of me against everybody else, you sometimes have this idea when you're on an American set, it's like there's two or three people that eat well and everybody else is just suffering. Yeah. You know, and and then I'm sometimes wondering with some of these people that are eating well, how much is enough or is, is it never enough? And if you were sharing a little more of the credit and of the of the glory and letting a few more people in and, and helping them to rise up, then the, pro the product would probably become better because there's no way one person can write 10 great things in a year all by themselves. You know what I mean? It's going to get better if you let some people in. Wow. And and that's just that's just something that about the American mindset sometimes turns me off a little bit. But all over, I like working in both markets. I find amazing people everywhere. And yeah, but those are some of the difference I could point out, I guess. Like, like for instance, when I first came to a set that I was a producer on, which which was which was for for my last day without you, it's right above you, a movie that I did in New York City where I was a producer and a writer on it. And, you know, we raised the money ourselves. It was like a $1 million sweet little love story with Nikki Bahari starring, who then after that became became a pretty big name. And and and, and uh, I was so shocked that people apologized for looking at me or talking to me because I was a producer. Like there was this, <laughs> there was this sense of awe on set that I didn't know from Germany or anywhere else. I had been on movie sets, Switzerland or Austria or something. Like everyone gets so nervous around producers and there's this, this almost like a military hierarchy type of yeah. energy on set. So that was another thing that I only know that to be true for America. Gotcha. So we you just talked a little bit about your film, My Last Day Without You. Which yeah. won an award for best independent film? Um, can you tell us what the message you was hoping to convey with the film? Um, yes, that was actually... Um, the biggest thing is actually, I think it's on the poster, right? It says in a New York minute, a lifetime of love that happened to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, that was, this is a sad story because the person I fell in love with in New York city, a, 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 a whole lifetime ago, unfortunately passed away uh, from, from cancer years later, but that was my first wife and, and we, um, uh, Joe, and we met in New York city. And so th the idea of two people meeting and spending an amazing day together and their whole lives being completely derailed by it, but in a good way, because they, and first in a stressful way, and then in a good way, because they find love and they say, what if you change everything and you just drop everything and you decide for love, you choose love. And on top of it also, she's black and he's white. So yeah, it was a bit autobiographical and uh, and also, honestly, this sounds funny now, but this movie is um, now 13 years old. When I, we had the premiere here in Atlanta. Look at the full poster, right? Like you see Nicole's face up there. Mm -hmm. And you know, nowadays you probably have seen her on, on the morning show and, and Apple, Apple's thing. And, and, and she's done so many things, um, great projects. She's so good, but, and she's still a good friend. But, but I was carrying the poster after the, the the festival premiere in Atlanta, I was carrying the poster around the Atlanta airport. I'll never forget, like 13 years ago. And you know how many women stopped me, black women on the airport and said, what is that? Because at that time, you did not see a movie, a romantic poster where a black woman's face is shown in that way on the poster. That was an absolute rarity. Obviously, that shows you how much has changed right. in a short time. But so for us, it was also important to give um, this actress who we all really fell in love with and believed in, someone like her, give her a platform and give and show that it's possible to tell a story where the black woman is not suffering. She's not going through horrible hardships. Her boyfriend is not in prison. You know, like all of that. <laughs> yes, but really just a, a strong romantic story where she's she's a powerful person who uh, you know? Who has a who has an interesting and fascinating life, and wins love for herself. Nice, nice. Yeah, was, now, yeah. you've won an Emmy for A Day for a Miracle, and you've also been Golden Globe nominated. Yeah. For Goodbye, is it Lenin? Yeah, Goodbye Lenin. The film, the film was nominated for Golden Globe for best best um, foreign film. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so can you tell everybody what what does that mean to you to receive you know those recognitions and those awards and nominations on a globe to a global audience? 
you know, it's very interesting because we often argue among ourselves, like in 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 people in the industry that are, that have sort of been to that place. How much do awards mean versus viewership? I mean, you talked earlier in your introduction about the fact that your film is now available to people all over the world, right? And 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 to me, honestly, it doesn't matter as much. Like awards are interesting, but there's always a politic behind it. And I've I've watched awards where I was like, how the hell did that win over that? So right. someone else might say that about my project. So I'm I'm not, I'm not trying to get too, I'm not trying to take it for granted that it means I'm the best because I won this award. The greatest thing to me about awards, and that's just me, the person that's crazy about working in this industry and telling more of my stories that are important to me, or bringing some other people with me that I think have great stories. The big thing about awards is it allows me to do more of that, period. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. opens more doors because you can always, when you're an Emmy winner, you can walk around, like it changes you know, the, the conversation. You, like Absolutely. You always, it's always good for you to be in the room. Nobody cares anymore. So I, I'll take that. You know what I mean? In Germany, uh, yeah, there's the Grimme Prize, which is like one of the most important TV awards. And we're winning another one now with Sam Saxon. I won another one many years ago on my birthday, by the way. But those things are, it's great because because it keeps me in the conversation and I can tell more stories because that matters to me in my heart. Right. But ego wise, I really, yes, I, I put my awards here because, you know, when I do my calls, I learned that in Hollywood, let people know what you've done. But for myself, it means nothing. My dad told, taught me, and it's one of the most valuable lessons he gave me, and God rest his soul. He said, um, approach every one of your projects as if it's the first. Mm. Like come in with that humility and and with that sort of pureness of heart and mind and 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 because I want to have respect to the story I'm telling. And so sometimes even in meetings, like people that work with me, it's been a good run, but I don't try to be in a script meeting as the writer looking like I know everything. And I'm I'm never trying to be like arrogant, become arrogant about other people's opinions. Right is a collaborative process. So I'm rather willing to constantly set myself back and say, maybe there's something I haven't looked at. You know, I like that, Chris. I don't know. I like that a lot. OK. It's a good thing for life, too, by the way. Yeah. I, I think it works in, in, in relationships, you know? Like, hey, maybe my partner sees something about me that I haven't been seeing. Maybe, maybe I could use a little hint, you know, a little feedback. <laughs> Right, right. So this is actually a good way to segue into. Let's talk about your collaboration with your lovely oh, wife, so <laughs> Hello, Grace. What do you two got cooking up? Oh yeah, we. I mean, we we've got you know we've got our own business set up, uh, Silver Love Productions, because Tracy's middle name is Love, mm -hmm. and uh, and so we are developing a couple of things together. I have one film that we already actually have a film out. We, we did a Christmas movie in Germany, a Christmas, sweet little Christmas TV movie, sort of based on our own experience with Tracy coming in as the new partner, as stepmom to, to, to mostly my daughter, my son's already out of the house, but you know, that was, that was really fun to do that as a, as a project. And we're actually, we might do a remake of that here in the U S we're talking to some people about that. There's some interest. And then we're doing projects. Um, we have like a whole list of ideas. The biggest right now that I'm mostly sort of just supporting Tracy through as a producer, as in some ways a mentor to her, to her writing process is, um, is a story called um, Leave Her Alone, which has to do with her grandmother's story. And I'm sure you guys touch on it when you talk. Mm -hmm. Grandma was such an amazing person. I also feel like, yeah, I mean, she did. The first time I met her, after a weekend, she came to me and said, you can call me grandma, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she was a, such a sweet and such an inspiring person. And, and I'm grateful for all the time that I got to spend with her. And so, you know, I, I was, I just sort of have been supporting and backing up Tracy in making sure that the story gets told as a film and possibly also as a, as a book release. So that's probably the biggest thing we're working on right now. And then, you know, a couple of other things. We're always got some things cooking. I love it. I love it. Um, do you have plans to return to teaching screenwriting or mentoring? I love teaching. So I'm always sort of mentoring by doing as much as I can in terms of 
So the ideal thing is this, right? When when I was doing Samus Saxon, there was a young writer that I thought was extremely talented. And, and I mean, there were a lot of great writers. One stood out a little bit more to me. And uh, mm -hmm. her, name, her name is Malina in India and Germany. And, and so I said, Malina, and she came to me because uh, I, I took her on. I said, write the fi finale with me. I want you to write the final episode with me. And I, I picked her for that. And, and then she said, can you mentor me after this? And I said, no, what I can do is write with you. Like, just no, let's yeah. just do projects together. And let's, so I learned from you and you learned from, from me because, you know, she, she's, she's much younger. She has a much different perspective on life, um, different ethnicity. And so many things about her are different from me. And I'm like, let's, you know, I want to see this as a, as a give and take. So that's one way I'm always teaching and, and, and finding people that I can somehow collaborate with and, uh, and the other thing is, yeah, like really, I have done actual professor jobs as as a film professor at La Sierra University in California. I did that for two years. It's hard to balance it with with my career with with projects, but I really want to do more of it. I'm actually I just spoke to Tracy about that the other day about can we figure out um, possibly just start starting some connections again with universities or colleges and see if there's a place because in the next few years I'd love to go back and. Do actual teaching. It's so much fun, and and, and having a studio right there in, in, in university, it's just I'm I'm crazy. I'm always working on like six different projects at the same time at least, and so, you know, uh, got to make time for it. Maybe I'll wait a few more years till I'm a little calmer with my own career. Okay, okay. Well, I would like to. Um, we're we're coming down to our last our last of our time. So I would like to thank you so much for being a part of Transparency Talks podcast. I also want to let everyone know that Chris is going to be one of the panelists at our next BBR Indie Films, which is going to be on May 15th. So, you know, I'm ecstatic yeah. about that. Catalyst. <laughs> <laughs> it's on your birthday. What'd you say? It's on your birthday, right? It's on my birthday, Chris. So, you know, we're going to turn all the way up. Love that. Yeah. So um, again, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to me. I have learned so much about you. I'm going to go and finish watching Sam the Sax, Sam of Saxon. Honestly, I'm telling y'all, if y'all have not seen this, it's on Hulu, it's on Disney. You should absolutely watch it. It will have you glued to the TV, not wanting to go to sleep like I did. And um, thank you for your time. So with that, everybody, we are out of here. Do you have any last things you want to say, Chris? Yeah, no, please watch Sam and Saxon. I know it's a weird title. We didn't choose that, but please watch the show because you're going to see a different perspective on black storytelling that I promise you have never seen. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, everybody, so with that, we are out of here and we will talk to you guys later. Chris, you stay on, but I'll talk to you guys later. Peace, y'all. <laughs>